All right, if you guys have got your handouts, we are on uh, foundation number eight, which is the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> Always one of my favorite lessons in discipleship. Um, fills in a lot of gaps for most people when they finally realize everything that he's done for them. So foundation number eight is the Holy Ghost says, the day you received the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you received a gift you may not recognize. That gift is the often overlooked Holy Spirit of God. The third person of the Godhead took up permanent residency inside in your body. And the placement and person of the Holy Ghost is one of the most misunderstood and ignored parts of a Christian's relationship with God. He is misunderstood by heretical liberals who attribute anything their wild imaginations make up to his ministry. He is ignored by dead orthodox conservatives who think the supernatural is to be shunned and, the, and rest instead on their humanistic reason rather than faith and believing doctrine. This lesson is designed to give you a biblical view of the role of the Holy Spirit in your life so that you and him can be complete in fellowship and faith. So, uh, point number one here, the person of the Holy Ghost slash Spirit of God. Point A, he is the third person of the Trinity or Godhead. Turn over to uh, Matthew chapter 28. Passage you're always, all familiar with, I'm certain. Matthew twenty-eight nineteen says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in, them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So you have the, the three there, and he is the third person listed. Look in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7. By the way, 1 John 5, 7 is one of the uh, passages that... Um, Everybody loves to say that this shouldn't be in the Bible, is, that isn't in there. Um, well, if you take it out, it makes the tenses of the next verse make no sense if it's not there. Um, and also, there are unbroken manuscript witnesses from right after the apostles all the way to today. It's pretty consistent. It's kind of unbelievable that they would say that. But they do anything to undermine pure doctrine. First uh, John 5, 7 says... Uh, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So he is the third person of the Trinity or the Godhead. Point B, he is the giver of life in the creation. Look at Genesis 2.7. Genesis 2 7. If we compare Scripture with Scripture, which we will do here, it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So that breath of life is going to become important because look over here in Job chapter 33. Job 33 and verse 4 says, The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. So he is the one who puts life into people. Now look in Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. This is one that uh, had a guy trying to tell me that the spirit of god didn't exist until after after the after christ's resurrection which is ridiculous 
I mean, he's mentioned all over the Old Testament. Clearly, somebody's never read his Bible. But um, th that's called modalism, by the way, that, that, that God changes modes, and he's really, there's not a trinity. There's just one, and they just keep, keep changing throughout time, and it's ridiculous. It's a, it's, a, it's a false doctrine. And he didn't know what he was saying. He came back later and said, yeah, I was wrong. But if you look here in Genesis 1.1, it says something quite interesting that most people don't notice. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Genesis 1-2, he's mentioned. I mean, come on. This is not hard. Okay. I'm not sure how you missed that one. Uh, then Matthew 1-18, getting back to the idea that he is the creator and the giver of life. Matthew 1, 18. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise when his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Okay, but look at verse 20. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So this is the, uh, that is where he came from. But now look in Luke chapter 1, and you get to see that process. Luke chapter 1 and verse 35. Luke 1, 35 says, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, that, th that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So he is a part of giving life. Look in John chapter 20 and verse 22. John chapter 20 and verse 22, this is Jesus speaking, and he says, And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now there is God breathing and telling you that's the Holy Ghost, that his breath is the Holy Ghost. Now look in 1 Corinthians 15, and it tells you, What's happening there? 1 Corinthians 15, 45, which says, So it is written, the first man Adam was made a living soul, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost are synonymous. Right? You can't disconnect them in any way. Oh, by the way, it says in 1 Peter that he was when he was resurrected that he was, that Jesus was quickened by the spirit it's a fact you just can't explain it there's no way to explain it it's just crazy so point c he is the spirit component of the triune god look in john chapter 7 verse 35 triune means 3 and 1 And just like you, you have a body, soul, and a spirit. God has a body, a soul, and a spirit. Jesus Christ is the body. God the Father is the soul. He's the decider. And the Holy Spirit is the spirit. Very simple. Um, John chapter 7 and verse 35, which says, Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither will he go? Why do I have that in there? I have no idea. That is not, oh no, it's 39, sorry, change that. But this he spake of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Sorry, I got the wrong number on there. Change that to a 9. 
Then John chapter 4, and verse 24. John 4, 24. God is a spirit. <laughs> I mean, so Jesus is a spirit. God is a spirit. The spirit is the Holy Ghost. These, all these things are the same. I mean, you just can't get away from it. So, so there's that. All right, point number two. The present permanent residence of the spirit. Where is he and what is he doing? Okay, point A. The Holy Spirit of God dwells inside your body if you are saved. He came in at the moment of salvation, even if you felt nothing, and took up permanent residency. Number one, this is made possible because of Christ's promise and his glorification. Look in John chapter 14. <clears throat> John chapter 14. Look at verse 16 and 17. Jesus speaking, and he says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you for a little while. Is that what it says? No, forever. Forever. That he may abide with you, abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you. Look at this. So right there. Old Testament still, Christ has not died and raised from the dead, so it's still Old Testament. He says, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Now there's the promise, okay? Now look in John chapter 7, and John tells you when that was going to take place and what was going to open the door for that to take place. John chapter 7, verse 38 through 39 we were just read, reading a little bit ago. It says, He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spake of the Spirit, that they that believe on him should receive. They haven't received it yet, but they will. That they which believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. There's certain things as to happen, for the way to be, for you to be cleansed so that he can reside within you. And that's what had to happen. The sacrifice had to be made. So, there is that permanent residence that is made possible by that. Now, <clears throat> look at number two. He is received by faith in the unchanging gospel of grace and not by emotions or works. Because you get a lot of that out there. You gotta work it up. You gotta get this, get yourself all jacked up, and then he'll he'll do something with you. Or if you just work hard enough and you be live a pure enough life, then the Holy Ghost, no. You can't earn it. It's a gift of grace. Galatians chapter 3, verse 2 and 3 says this: This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. You have to believe and you receive. Verse 3, are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Why? Don't leave what you've been given, right? Don't leave it. You've been given it, stick with it. You've been, you've been given everything that you need at the moment you got saved, okay? <clears throat> now, look at chapter 4 and verse 6. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his son into your hearts crying abba father he sends him forth and there he is and that's what gives you your relationship with god the father point b your body right now is the temple of the holy spirit first corinthians Now, how many of y'all, when you got saved, didn't know this? Didn't know any of this was possible or that it was true? When you got saved, you didn't know the Holy Spirit come and live inside you forever. Okay. Right? Right? Okay. Didn't know it. Well, neither did the Corinthians. 
<laughs> Nobody knows it initially because it, there's no there's no evidence for it except for the Word of God. And then you see them everywhere once you see it. All right? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. What? Know ye not? <laughs> right? They didn't know. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So right there, he's, he's dwelling within you. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 22. And this is everywhere. Ephesians 2, 22. Talking about the church, he says, In whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. You're, you're God's house. He lives in you. So, point number three. We're going to look at the past and the present ministry of the Spirit and clear up any of that confusion that you see out there in the world. Number point A, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came on people, came on to people for short periods of time for service and empowerment. Now, this is where your charismatics get it wrong. They think he still operates that today, that he comes and he goes. No, if he goes, you're lost. You just lost your salvation, which they believe you can do, some of them. Well, the fact is you can't uh, because he doesn't ever leave. So in the Old Testament, that was true. Look at, let's look at the example of Saul. Not exactly a shining beacon of truth and uh, justice in the world. But the Holy Spirit came upon him to accomplish things. 1 Samuel 10.6 says, And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shall be turned into another man. Well, that's what happens when the Holy Spirit comes inside you. He creates in you a new person. You become a new creature in Christ. Well, the problem with Saul was he didn't have the blood covering him. Right? He didn't have Jesus' blood sealing that thing until the day of redemption. Look in 1 Samuel 16, verse 14. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. See that? It departed, and that's exactly how the Holy Spirit operated. He would come upon somebody to accomplish a task, and then he'd go. Why? Because they weren't sanctified. They weren't set apart. Christ's blood hadn't been shed. The blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. So he couldn't remain there long without killing him. Right? So that's how that worked. <clears throat> look at the, let's look at the example of Samson, another shining beacon of not-so-great character. but is in the hall of faith. So take that for what it's worth. Judges chapter 13, verse 25. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshketol. So the, Lord, the Spirit of the Lord started coming upon him and moving him to do things. All right, look in chapter 14 and... Verse 6, same page in my Bible. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid, and he had nothing in his hand, but he told not his father or his mother what he had done. That's, talk, that's talking about when he tears that lion into pieces, like he would have just taken a little lamb and snapped its neck. He just, whoosh, done. He just tore it in pieces. Right? The Holy Spirit came upon him to accomplish that. Look in verse 19. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon and slew thirty men of them and took the spoil and gave changes of garments unto, unto them which expounded the riddle, and his anger was kindled, and he went up to his father's house. So he, the Spirit would come on him, and he'd do something, and then he'd, he'd go and have problems. Look in uh, chapter 15 and verse 14. And when he came unto Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the cords that were upon his arms became as flax 
that was burned with fire and his bands loosed from off his hands. He just snapped them like tissue. <clears throat> so that is an Old Testament example of how the Holy Spirit operated. Now, in the present church age, the Holy Spirit indwells believers. That transition can be clearly seen from Jesus' words in John fourteen seventeen, which we already read, where it says that he dwelleth with you and shall be in you, right? Okay, now, look at the present truth of the indwelling spirit at being declared ever since. Look in Romans eight eleven. <clears throat> Romans eight eleven. Romans eight eleven says, But the Spirit, but if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Two times in that passage he talks about the result of the Spirit dwelling in you, not coming on you, not dwelling with you, as it says over there in John 14. It says he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Now he's in them. He's not dwelling with them. He's dwelling in them. Big difference. Okay? 1 <clears throat> Timothy, 2 Timothy 1.14, excuse me. 2 Timothy 1.14. says, that good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. In, not with, in. Okay? And that's, that's huge to understand. So let's look at the example of Stephen. Acts. Acts chapter 6 and verse 5 says, and the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. Right? He was full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. He dwelled inside him and filled him up. Okay? Chapter not, or verse 9. And there arose certain of the synagogue, which, uh, which called the synagogue of the, the Libertines and the Cyrenians, and the Alexandrians, and of them the Scylla of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. See that? They couldn't resist it. They couldn't resist his words. They couldn't resist his spirit. All right? Look in chapter 7, verse 55. Here he is, just got done preaching to the Sanhedrin, and now they're stoning him to death. Acts 7.55 says, But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. He was totally filled with the Spirit. Okay? Now, look the other the example of the other Saul, who's also called Paul. Look in Acts chapter 9 and verse 17. Acts 9.17 says, and, uh, and Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way, as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Not have him come upon him, to fill him. Okay? Now look in chapter 13, verse 9 and 11. 9 to 11, excuse me. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, just in case you wondered who this Saul guy was, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Now notice there the positive and uplifting messages the Holy Spirit gave to both Stephen and to Paul. Right? 
thou, thou full of oh, full of subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, the enemy of all righteousness. Yeah, speaking by the Spirit. You want to know how God talks? That's how He talks. Just read Matthew twenty-three. Same kind of thing. You don't pull no punches. All right. So. In the present dispensation, point C here, in the present dispensation, the Holy Spirit is sent to all the world to convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Look in John chapter 16. Verse 8 and 9. John 16, 8 and 9. He's talking about the comforter in the context. And he says, And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. <clears throat> so, that's, that's what he's come to do. And actually, that should be 2.11. I need to change that. Okay. So, point number one... The lost, he convicts of sin, wrongdoing, and righteousness, not doing right, and the coming judgment to bring them to salvation. See that? They're convicted so that they can come to salvation. Go to Revelation. If you want to see the judgment that you're dealing with there. Revelation chapter 20. Verse 10, remember he said that for the prince of this world is judged? Well, here's the prince, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on him, from whose face the, heaven, the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So that's the salvation that they are supposed there's that's the judgment that they're supposed to look at and say I need to be saved because of sin and because of righteousness right I don't I do all the wrong things and I don't do any of the right things that's it right okay now point number 2 the saved he convicts of sin doing evil deeds and righteousness doing right deeds in light of their salvation and the coming judgment seat of Christ which we will deal with in a later lesson. He does this to keep them clean and to show them how to live for Jesus. 2 Corinthians 3.18 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So point D, the Holy Spirit has a specific role in the life of, of a believer. Number one, he regenerates the new believer. Look in 2 Corinthians 5.17, same page in my Bible. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Well, how is that accomplished? Well, look in Titus. Titus chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. It says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. See that? He renews you, he regenerates you, washes you, makes you what you need to be. Second, he is the seal of your salvation. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, 
verse 13 and 14. It says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Just like when a government puts a seal on your birth certificate, you have a birth certificate in heaven. And that seal is the Holy Spirit of God. It ain't going nowhere. You're trying, good, good, good job trying to rub him off. It ain't going to work. Okay? Chapter 4 and verse 30. It says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Notice it does not say, as the NIV does, that you're sealed for the day of redemption. Or that you, and that you were sealed for the day of redemption. Well, what does that mean? It means you could possibly lose it, maybe not be sealed for the day of redemption. No. King James says you were sealed unto it. In other words, you're there already and you can't get out of it. You're literally sealed to it. You're, you're attached to it. And the seal can't be broken. And that's the way it is. So, that's what that means. And we talked about that when we talked about um, uh, when we talked about eternal security. So, that's the seal of your salvation. Number three, he bears witness, reminds you. This, to bear witness means to remind you as many times as you need it, he bears witness of your salvation. Look in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 13. First John 4, 13. It says, Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, notice he's dwelling in you, and he in us because he hath given us of his spirit. He's given you his spirit and he dwells in you and you dwell in him. That's, that's a fact, Jack. And that's how you know for certain. Okay? Now look in Romans chapter 8 and verse 16. Romans eight sixteen. says the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God so that's part of his job is that he bears witness he reminds you that you're his and he'll say it to you as many times as you need it said you ever doubt just ask him he'll bear witness okay he is also your bible teacher number 4 John 14:6 You've got the Holy Spirit. You came with a built-in Bible teacher. John 14, 6. Jesus saith, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Then... And that actually should not be that. That should be 26. Put a 2 in there. I'm like, wait a second. That is not right. It's a good verse, but, you know. That should be 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. That is the supernatural presence of him in you to teach you and to remind you of whatever you need to be reminded of. Okay? Look in chapter 16, verse 13 to 15, which says, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore said, that, said I that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. So that's what he does. He teaches you and he shows you what Jesus 
and the Father wants you to see. Now, look in 1 Corinthians. So don't quench the Spirit. He's got something to tell you, and it comes from a pretty high up place. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10. It says, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. Yeah, it never entered into your heart, but it entered into your spirit. But he has revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Anything you need to know, he'll give it to you. He can show you things that your heart couldn't imagine. All right. He is your Bible teacher, but he also intercedes for you, number five, in prayer. Romans 8, 26. Romans 8, 26 through 27. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities for we know not what we should pray for as we ought but the but the spirit itself maketh intercession for us with your, with groanings which cannot be uttered and he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God so what happens is is God searches your heart finds out what you want and the holy spirit translates that thing into a prayer when you're trying to pray it and don't know what to say. That's exactly how it works. And he does it according to God's will. So you know you always get heard in prayer. 100% every time. That's exactly the way it is. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 18. Ephesians 2.18 says, For through him, that's Jesus, we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. You've got access. You've got access. You've always got access. Point number six, He comforts you in time of need. Look at John 14 again. John chapter 14, verse 15 to 18 says, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, or neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. <clears throat> Look in 2 Corinthians. Oh, he says, verse 18, sorry. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. You notice the Spirit of God comes and Jesus comes with him? They're the same person. It's crazy, but true. Um, 2 Corinthians. <clears throat> Chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So right there, God the Father is involved in that deal too. Right? And look in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7. 2 Timothy 1, 7. It says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. All right? So if you're fearful, doubting, feel like you're going crazy, not loving right, Spirit of God's your buddy. Spirit of God's your pal. You know, cure what ails you. Just ask it. All right. Number seven, he empowers you to serve God. Look at Zechariah 4 6. Anybody here quote it? 
Oh, come on, you got to memorize this one. Really. You should know this one. You probably do know it, you just don't know you know it. Zechariah 4, 6. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. See that? We are, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Right. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 16. Ephesians 3.16 That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man which by the way is where he lives. Right? He strengthens you with might on the inside. Alright? And then 2 Corinthians 4.7 2 Corinthians 4, 7. It says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. They're weak. They break easily. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. He gets the glory for the power. And then number eight, he guides in decision making. He doesn't tell you. He doesn't advise you, I should say, in what to decide. He's the decider. If if you're walking right. If you're walking wrong, then you're on your own. Right? Quenching him, you're grieving him. He can help you. Doing what's right, trying to do the best you can, allow him to fill your whole life to make every decision based on what he decides. He'll guide you. Do here, go here, don't go here. Real easy. It'll make it obvious. Scary even. <laughs> Psalm 32. Look in uh, look down here. Verse 8 and 9. It says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Now, here's the thing. That's God speaking right there. I will guide thee with mine eye. In the book of Song of Solomon, the bride of Christ is said to have dove's eyes within her locks. What does a dove represent in the scripture? It's the Holy Spirit. He descended in bodily form like a dove and lighted upon Christ. Dove's eyes. You are supposed to have dove's eyes. He's supposed to guide you with his eye. Get it? Book, man. It's all there, everywhere. Look at this. I will guide thee with mine eye. Be not as the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. In other words, you should be smart enough to not him have to constantly be jerking your reins all the time. Right? That's the way it's supposed to be. Let him guide you with his eye. He'll let you see what you could not otherwise see. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Take these promises to the bank. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. You don't trust Him, you quench the Spirit. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. Don't just be out there thinking on your own. Don't lean to your understanding. He says, in all thy ways acknowledge him, acknowledge the Holy Spirit, and he shall direct thy paths. Write it down, memorize it, and quote it back to him anytime you need help. You said you would direct my paths. I need my paths directed. And he's good for it. He really is. Acts 16. Let's see a living example of it. Acts chapter 16. In the life of those who had the indwelling spirit. See, in the Old Testament, you've got to kind of watch it. Sometimes it's 
Sometimes he'll teach you something. Sometimes he can't, doesn't quite apply because he wasn't permanent. These guys had him. He was permanent. Right? Acts chapter 16, verse 6 to 10 says, Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. You know sometimes the Holy Spirit will tell you not to preach? And not to say something to somebody? Usually it's our fault, right? Usually I'm too chicken. I, I'm not going to say it. But then sometimes you're not too chicken. You've decided to do it and God just stops you. He says, no. The car breaks down. Something happens. And now I guess I ain't going. Holy Spirit. It's his job. Look at the next verse. After that, uh, after... They were uh, come to Mysia. They essayed to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. No, I've got a different plan. He is perfectly capable of stopping you from going where he doesn't want you to go. Then, verse 8, And they passing by Mysia came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia in Europe, and prayed him, saying, Come over unto us in, in, into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. <clears throat> All right, we're going to have to stop there. So we're going to be on number four, the transforming results of the Spirit next time I hope that makes his role in your life a little bit clearer and if you're teaching it to somebody you can pass that along so let's uh, Scott you want to pray and dismiss us